Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Advanced Refrigeration Podcast. You're those Brett Wetzel and Kevin Compass. Wow, your office looks different, even more than so last time. But you moved the desk. Yeah, I moved the desk, and then I there isn't piles and piles of Dan Foss parts behind me. There's just piles of parts. There's not Dan Foss ones. But yeah, those are all microthermal boards. Cool. Those are the oh shit boards. <laughs> yeah. Pretty beat. Must have yep. went up and down three flights of stairs about a hundred times a day. I'm doing a EMS conversion and the rag is on the third floor of like it's really it's a really weird building. The rack is three flights above the building, yet the building is a standalone building. So it's a really funky building. Like it you gotta go up three flights of stairs to get to the rack. Mm -hmm. but, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to envision what the hell you're talking about. I don't understand. The, the building like steps down, like the interior of the store is like only 20 feet, but the rise to the rack room has got to be every bit of 40 to 60 feet. So you got to go what up a ladder up on the outside of the building yeah, and then you go like upstairs in this little tiny corridor and they are like super tight. I've been like running up and down these stairs nonstop and there's no good way to get wi-fi out of the rooms i'm trying to do this control conversion and it's a concrete box with steel all around it so i guess the normal thing of trying to use team view or something like that is not really working all that well nope so it's been like it and now like i had to run tomorrow i i, I only had enough ethernet cable to get the controllers pulled so like i Hopefully tomorrow I'll have an entire box of Ethernet cable. I'll be dropping it down the stairs and planting a router somewhere in the ceiling because I am uh, not going to keep running up and down because this is miserable. How deep is the concrete? It's got to be every bit of a foot. You drill bits, don't you? Yeah. Then <laughs> I, I wouldn't drill on this floor. I'd be afraid it would fall in. Oh, don't say that. That's horrible. This whole ceiling in the rack room's falling in. I'm like going through the like parts. I'm like, man, why are all these boxes wet? And oh, it's leaking through the roof. Yep. Awesome. Yeah. Then we were doing the switch over today and then I'm looking at this RMCC and I'm like, boy, something doesn't look right with this thing. And I'm like looking at it more and more. I'm like, it's not even close to the store print. And the store print's not even close to being right. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you because I saw you posted something today about trying to figure out if RMCC, you could download anything to get the points list and what, it, what did you come up with? So hey, you, you literally hit, you could print off the store, which I already know you could print off the entire store off Ultrasite. The only problem is it's 37 pages long. And this is the small rack. The glycol rack is 51 pages. So it's got all this useless information we don't need to know. I just need the points. Mm -hmm. There's no way to pull it on 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 there. So I'm going to plan B. I'm going to try to upload it in chat GTP and ask chat GTP to isolate just those words. Oh. So it's not like you can't just do outputs, inputs, whatever? No. So like on the E2, like you, you could look at the... You could right click and go into like analog outputs or analog inputs, and you could literally print that whole screen. You mm -hmm. can't do that with RMCC. You got to print the whole controller. <laughs> Ooh, that's lame. And it, what, what sucks is it goes in order by circuits. At this store, there's five remote panels for the low temp, and there's 13 for the medium temp. Oh, Lord. There's just stuff scattered all over the place. And it's, it's been remodeled probably 30 times. It was Pekathol at one point. So it's one of those inner city stores? Yes. And it was originally Glycol and Pekathol. Now it's Glycol and DX and some hybrid Glycol DX rack. What's Pekathol? Pekathol is the Glycol of the devil. Oh. <laughs> it, it's basically like a salt brine solution that a chain of stores in Chicago tried to use. It was CO2 before CO2. Like it was this great new thing that was going to take the refrigerant out of the store. And it was basically like 80% or like 60% salt. So it's, it was a low temp brine solution able to yes. go low. Okay. All right. All right. That makes more sense. I, I was confused. Cause I'm like, why would you have two different glycols? But that, that kind of makes more sense. It ate 
everything. Oh, is that the stuff where you said you got it on your shoe and it like just ate the leather and, and out of you your shoes? Sure pull up the leather on your shoes. If you got it on your tools, like any leather on, or any rubber on the tools would instantly shrivel, like instantly rust tools. If you spilled some in the back of your van, it would shrink the rubber mat in the floor. Mm -hmm. It was just like the most corrosive stuff on the planet. It would, it would eat the solder out of the joints. And the joints would just blow out of lines. So it was even for the coils and stuff. Yeah. So there was a half the stores got soft soldered up here, and half the stores got uh, brazed. The only ones that held up were the brazed stores. All the soft solder stores they were wrapping aircraft cable around valve stations to try to keep the the pipes in when they blew out. <laughs> I, I actually, I've never heard of the, you know, what'd you call it? Peg, Pegasol? Pegasol. Never heard of it. Never. It was a thing up here, I think. And that was about it. There was like 14 or 15 stores with it. And they, they ripped it out and went to right straight DX. Yeah. They, it, it made it like six, seven years. If you look at the tops of the walk-ins, they all look like they're 60 years old. Like it just, everywhere that it blew out, it, it ate through the galvanized on the walk-ins. Holy it, crap. It destroyed all the cases. Jesus. It, if, it, if it got anywhere near electrical, it just instantly exploded. Well, send me that, send me that IO list so I can play around with it and see if I can figure it out how to do it. Yeah, I'm going to send it to you tonight or tomorrow because if anybody could pull it off chat GTP, it's probably you. I'll try. I'm home this week. Last week, I, I told you we were doing our first like, commercial class, which was amazing. Went really well. Didn't really no snafus. We had, like I said, me, another instructor there, and a guy that was the uh, that helped build the curriculum and put everything. He's basically the orchestrator. We get a map together and try to figure out what what to go where, and it was just amazing. There wasn't there was probably throughout the day if you had eight hours of instru of of time, it was probably if probably fifty fifty or in on certain days it was like twenty five. Uh, 75. So you'd never had under 50% of lab time. And then some days we had upwards of 75. So we, we had so many labs and just so much stuff. So it was, it's like commercial. So like we were uh, doing uh, steel, the co steel, the copper, aluminum, copper or aluminum uh, soldering, we're checking gas pressure on rooftop units and working on single systems, understanding defrost, had them wire up whole defrost panels and stuff. It was really good. And everyone walked away feeling like they, they really learned something. They said it was like really, they thought it was more involved and it was just awesome. It was, it just went really well. So that's what I did. And so now this week I'm catching up because every week I go out of town, I get emails and I just don't answer anything. Not intentionally. If I see something really important, I'll scope it out. But most of the time I'm, I'll answer it later. But tonight we're gonna finish up our winter PMs. We're gonna talk about winter PMs. Yeah, we're gonna finish the uh, winter PMs and get a little bit into the uh, HVAC side of stuff. We are okay. I'll do whatever. So I remember last time we talked about making sure you do the work, work making sure the holdback valves are set, the receiver pressurization valves. We talked about receiver heaters, making sure that the receiver heat trace is on, and that leads us into not everyone lives in. Texas or Florida. There are some places that get cold. There are some other things that have heat trace um, because of the cold, right? Now that we, a lot of the CO2 racks are being installed over the place, whether it be Cascade and or Transcritical, we have the adiabatic cooling, right? So that requires water. We need to make sure the heat trace is on. Most of the stores I've seen has just been on a regular um, thermostat. I don't, I don't think I've seen any off of the EMS of you. Hit or miss. Some of them have been on, like Targets has been on the EMS. Yeah. So they, they, they've they been using the EMS to cycle them on and off. Me personally, mm -hmm. I think it's cheap insurance. If I have a drain crack and I have a say in it, I'm putting a temp sensor on it. Oh, I right. think there should be a temp sensor on every heat tape. Yeah, we had this discussion before where you're like, yeah, I think even freezers, right? Because I would rather have an alarm on a piece of heat trace that decides just to to not get warm anymore before it, it turns into, hey, now I have 20 foot of whatever pipe to replace because it just, it's split down the middle. 100%, yeah, it's, I, I would much rather 
go there and be like, oh, the stupid GFI tripped because that was a good idea on heat tape that never works, but yet they keep putting it in everywhere. And just, I would much rather go do that than deal with the split drain later because it's just going to just nonstop, just make a huge mess. Fixing drains, especially in a freezer, sucks. Yeah, and just so you, I know Kevin said this a bunch of times, but he has the answer in case you have one of those mounds of ice that has just magically happened within 10 minutes of the line breaking and you you use the little uh, Milwaukee little jackhammer thing. Yeah, SDS. And just use it like a spade bit just to chop it up. Yep, so I just chop it up with the SDS and uh, it's uh, it works great. And you usually wrap that all the way up, right? You don't do it the lazy way where you're just going underneath the pipe when you're laying, you're laying the, the drain heater, right? You're actually wrapping it around. What, what's your rule of thumb, like how far the wraps are apart? So I usually do like a wrap an inch. Okay. So I go a little overboard on construction. Obviously, they we, we're not doing a wrap, a wrap an inch. Mm-hmm. It's... It's whatever the customer spec is at that point, but it's, I don't know. If I'm fixing it, it's getting a rapid inch. I like, I, I'd rather be hot. Heat tape draws no amps. It's expensive, but I'd much rather not have a problem and then it not free, especially if it's outside on like a cooling tower mm-hmm. and it's going to drain slower or there's no block and bleed. I'm going to make sure that thing is plenty warm and got good armor flex on it. 100%. That leads us into just making sure all your temperature sensors are obviously accurate because depending if where it's at, it might be controlling that rack during wintertime, right? So it could be the drain leg temperature sensor. There's some energy management systems that use the drain leg RDM, for instance. They instead of using the saturated condensing temperature to figure out what the what the T D is, they basically are taking the ambient temperature with the not the saturated condensing temperature, but the drain leg temperature making sure that temperature sensor is wrapped because it might overshoot or undershoot based if it's not insulated well. Typically any sensors that I see that are outside, they'll get wrapped, but also on top of it, if they have the availability to be beaded on by a little bit of sun, I usually use reflective tape on there to help prevent any kind of inaccuracies in temperature. Um, Why, Why would you use the drop leg temp? I don't know. I don't understand it. I don't get it. It's in there. It's in there. It's in their program. If you, yeah, it doesn't make any sense to me. I don't understand because I'd rather want more accuracy. Oh well, um, yeah, especially when yeah, pressure equals temperature till the point where it's like subcooled beyond belief. And that's my problem. You know what I mean? So like, it could be getting an inaccurate temperature based off of that, and making the fans. Let's see if the temperature got down lower because of the subcooling. Yeah, I don't know. I don't understand it. I don't get it, but obviously making sure also while you're doing the winter PM, making sure all your motors on your condenser, whether they be the impacts motors, those I think can go down to minimum percentage. But if you're talking about a regular uh, condenser fan or an evaporative condenser, I think on the evaporative condenser, I think you can go down to, if it's a BAC, I think you can go down to 20%. I I think I called, I don't remember if I called WEG or if I called uh, BAC to get those numbers, but I remember them saying, I think it was 20% that you can go low before it causes issues with the bearings and that. Yeah, that that's one of those things with those condensers, making sure they're set up properly. Like if the Gutners, make sure you're using that LLM mode so that way it can shed fans. I'm not a big fan of those ga- the gas cooler setups where they have that independent controller and you can't shed fans because it seems like they all want to keep them running and it's just not enough. It's not, there's not enough shedding to be able to run the gas cooler or even condenser properly because it wants to ramp all the fans up and down. And even at 15, 20%, you're not even close to what the capacity is of the rack. It's like a quarter of that. Yeah, because usually the gas coolers, condensers, whatever their size is for, what, 120, right? 120 degree max ambient. So that's why we typically split at 60. So theoretically at 60 degrees, they should have half its capacity at 60 degrees, which means, or, or I'm sorry, you should, 
yeah, you should only need half the condenser in order to, to do it, to get full condensing out of the full capacity of the rack at 60 degrees, which also means that if it gets 30 degrees outside, now you're almost quadruple size. If you can't shed those fans, you might have real low dips in there where it just shuts off and turns back on. And there are some regular condensers out there that do not like that. We're not supposed to cycle anything greater than, you know, 10 times, 10 times an hour. And okay. what's that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Such a and then some of the other stuff, if you short cycle on them a lot more, I've seen some fans blow apart and then that just ends up being horrible because once the fan blows apart, it becomes out of balance. Once it becomes out of balance, then it shakes whatever beam it's on, cracks that beam. And now all of a sudden you're there in the middle of the night with no gas in the rack because the beam fell down or the motor fell down into the condenser, which is always fun. Yeah, that that is by far one of the worst things you could have happen. That or like a plate and frame heat exchanger splits that, that's pretty awful too so that, that's another thing going over guys is making sure that you guys have rack houses that are on the roof and they have heat reclaim coils in them like heat exchangers make sure the heat works in there and if there's no heat make sure that three-way valve is functional and or whatever's controlling that so that heat exchanger doesn't split and fill the rack full of city water yeah, because then you have a bad time. Yeah, trying to get water out of a rack is a absolute nightmare. So that's another thing to make sure. That's another place that like a lot of people aren't putting temp sensors in, but like inside the rack house. So that way I know what the temp is in there before we have a splitting situation or even get to that. I would much rather get a uh, phone call that the rack is too cold. The rack room's too cold and I can go there and do something about it before something like that splits and we end up flooding everything full of water. Yeah. See, I've never had that happen. I mean, I've had it happen on chillers, but typically it's so bad where it happens so fast that, because of what's city water, 30 to 60 pounds, 60 PSI. So the rack has to get down on the condenser side down to that, or actually, you know, greater than the suction side. Oh yeah. Yeah. Man, Depends where you are. Like we have buildings where the city water pressure is like, or the water pressure coming into plate and frame heat exchangers is over a hundred pounds, 200 pounds. Damn. What? Yeah. Why 200? You get it like a 20, 30 story building. Damn. It's two, it's like 2.4 something SI per foot of rise. And you figure the grocery stores at the bottom floor. Yeah. There's a lot of pressure there. You you really don't want to freeze that. I got you. So that's that's a big one, making sure that all the little stuff that like people miss, the heat tape and the the heater controls and the bleed downs for like the adiabatic towers, making sure that the water if they have a vent line for the water to bleed it. So meaning like they block and bleed it like they they shut off the water supply line and they open another blemo or solenoid to drain the line backwards down downstairs, making sure that is functional. So you don't split the line on the roof. Now that you said split, that reminds me, check the split, just make sure it works. I know we talked about it before, but I don't know how many times a year I'll get a phone call. It's like, wow, it, it's not pumping out or it's not pumping out fast enough. So. My experience, I guess it depends on really the size of the condenser for one, and it, but it also depends on whether you're on low temp or medium temp. My rule of thumb is usually what, four, five to maybe six hours on a pump out on medium temp and two to four on low temp, depending on how, how big the, the condenser is. If it takes longer than that, like if you see something that's split all night long and it's not going in and out of split, then you got something going on whether it be, it could be a block piston for the pump out line. Another thing is too, you could have, it's something that has happened year after year and you know that there's nothing bad. Look for the placement of where the actual pump out is. And I've seen some where I, I had a, it was a full condensing heat reclaim. And when it would come out of heat reclaim, it would go, I think the line was like three and three and an eighth. And so the pump out line was like a quarter inch line or a three eighths line, but it was in the top of the pipe. So liquid would just sit in there and it would take literally, cause I timed it the one day and I was like three days, three days to pump out. So I like, I gave up and I was like, we need heat reclaim all year round for dehumidification now. So we're just going to leave that puppy in there. 
<laughs> yeah. It would, it would take forever to pump out. And no thanks. If a medium temp rack on split, that's another thing. If you guys are going to be doing work and you're working on a medium temp rack and there's a chance it may on split, you're honestly better off valving off the split side. Well, for the sure fact that it would just, it would, oh, all right. So I guess what you're saying is that the fact that you're at 18 degrees saturated, right? So if your pressure, if your outside air temperature gets all the way down to 18 degrees or below and it doesn't split properly, it's the, that refrigerant's just going to sit there and take the pressure of whatever the suction is. What does that mean? That means all that liquid is just going to sit out there because it's going to have no place to go. Yeah, we have two bullseye stores where they have fireman's dumps run on the roof and they're like 450 feet across the roof to wait, the wait, 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 elaborate fireman's dumps in chicago you have to have a fireman's dump line for anything over 50 pounds of refrigerant technically basically it's a valve and it's located like right by a fire exit and the fire department can come in and bust the glass out and take the globe valve off and dump the charge in the store Why, why would they do that? Well, because if there's a fire, it could hurt the firemen. Hmm. Gotcha. I, I have no idea. I've never seen or heard of anybody actually setting one off, but it, yeah, it, it's stupid. But what happens is it was condensing liquid on the medium temp racks on the roof because mm -hmm. it's two and five eighths line for a couple hundred feet. So it would get that cold on a roof that it would start to condense and it would get below 18 degrees. It would condense in the line. You could literally watch the liquid percentage just creep down as, as it got colder. And then you go over to the line on the roof and you could torch it and you could see a liquid level in the line. <laughs> It was, it was just hanging out in the lines and the condenser. Yeah, inside on the roof. But as soon as you would lower the rack SST, lower than outside air, it would just come back like a banshee and instantly fill up the receiver. <laughs> Damn. So also making sure that your bypass for your heat for your heat reclaim is not set too low. Or making sure also that, especially with your defrost, if you have too much stuff going into defrost, there's a high probability that the rack could short cycle. So when that happens is it's going to end up shutting off some compressors. And if they stay off for too long, you might stack that liquid in there and it doesn't want to go out of the cold. So the name of the game is just keeping those compressors running. The same thing with having too much of a load come back. There was a guy that I was talking to recently. I guess they did a remodel and when they did the defrost, they moved around the defrost schedule a little bit. So when the unit would come out of defrost, it would put so much of a load on this rack that it would just keep popping the thing in and out of split. So making sure that we don't have an excessive load where it's surpassing, especially with stuff with hot gas and cool gas. Yeah, making sure that stuff is set properly. The next thing I want to talk about is some like HVAC stuff that gets overlooked by most of us because most of us don't like working on HVAC stuff. And why is that? I don't know. It's just because it's on a roof. But I like working. You got a small little hand heater right there, right on the right on the gas heat. So no, I mean, I'm good. I really <laughs> have boilers in the winter time. But HVAC stuff guys like doing those pre spring PMs and making sure the heat all functions and you don't have crack heat exchangers. That's a huge one. Making sure that guys are finding the crack heat exchangers because that's winter work for guys. Keep, keep everybody working. And at the same time, I don't really want to be changing a heat exchanger in January. I would rather change them in November or December when it's, there's a foot of snow on the roof. That's a big thing. And then making sure that everything fires off and it fires off properly. And I, I'm a big fan of proving out rooftops once a week, like making them, making it like, if you have a store, like where you're servicing, mm -hmm. you could easily take the EMS system and make it prove the rooftops work every week. Well, I guess what you could do is 
put a alarm, I guess, if you, if you had any to, you could put an alarm and a sensor control and the call for heat would essentially be the enable. If you have a call for heat, you set up that temperature sensor to, you know, copy that sensor, the discharge air sensor. And if that discharge air temperature sensor doesn't reach X temperature, right, at the minimum, because if you look at every single rooftop unit that's, that's a gas heat pack, like on a carrier, typically their temperature rises anywhere from 25 to 55 degrees, typically. So if you don't on low, let's just say it's a low fire, high fires type situation, you might only get 20 degrees, 20, or sorry, 25 degree rise on the low fire and you might get up to 55. So if you calculate that, the, the, usually heat set for about 69 degrees or 68 degrees, you can figure out what that would be and what your discharge air should be, whether it be low or high fire. And then that would just basically prove out that if it doesn't reach that temperature in X amount of time, then you throw yourself an alarm. Yeah, if you're not seeing discharge air temps above 90 degrees, you got a problem. So unless the, room's, then, unless the room's 50. Yeah, <laughs> the, yeah then you got a problem. <laughs> but that that's one thing you really, I, I'm really big on now is like doing stuff like that because, yeah, it makes an alarm, but I would rather know about it under a controlled thing. And you could set it up to where it only alarms like during the day or, from say you set it up where it only alarms from seven in the morning till one o'clock in the afternoon on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, not Fridays. All you guys in, in Connecticut you know, where they have the I'll hold stores or what used to be the I'll hold stores. I don't know if they still are, but making sure you're checking those vestibule heaters, whether it be a, an outside, outside air makeup air unit type where it's all fresh air. Making sure those are working or make sure the unit here is working because I think that is probably the worst winter call you could probably get. That's non-refrigeration based where, yeah, our sprinkler just busted in our vestibule. Oh, it happens all the time out here. Between uh, that and like outside walls from unit heaters not working all the time. Wait, 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 wait. Outside, what about outside walls? Like with block concrete walls with no insulation in them? Oh, yeah. You get that cold, especially in some of these corners of these stores where they're remote. When it gets down to like negative 10, when we were popping sprinkler heads left and right. That, that That's one thing to make sure. I'm a big fan of proving out unit heaters work and proving out that rooftops work. And like putting discharge air temp sensors on, on unit heaters really don't cost that much money. So it, it's a great way to prove that they work. And then you could proof it once a week especially if you're in if you run it in-house why not because you could sit there and literally prove everything works and then i would rather get a call from an ems controller before the customer notices the heat's out and uh, everybody's all mad and uh i'm scrambling or it's the end of the week and i'm getting 15 rooftops that are that haven't worked in like months so I have a question, like on all the rooftop units that you're doing the changeovers for, when you're going from one EMS system to another, are you typically putting in alarms connected to the alarm set of contacts on the actual rooftop unit or no? No, I very rarely see alarm contacts on rooftop units. Yeah. I will say this though, the way Costco does it is quite nice with the Aon integration. Okay. Like they, they have like... There's safety line alarms. So if any safety opens up inside the rooftop unit, it tells you there's a safety line alarm. If if the compressors are controlled off microthermal, the heat's controlled off microthermal, the staging of the heat's controlled off microthermal. So they, they basically took an AI unit and they integrated the whole thing around microthermal. Really? So like they they built it out, like they would have their AN board there. There's mm -hmm. 700 boards there. They're doing the same thing as that. Really? So they do that with everybody though. Like they do it with, what's that company called that all they use is CES. So like they, they build out the same rooftop, except they build it out with iPro controls. Oh, okay. Or Corel. They just build it out. Aon makes a solid rooftop minus the heat box that the pins break off of. What heat box? So the Aon rooftops, especially the CES is at Aldi, what will happen is you'll get a uh, pressure switch error and it'll be flashing and you'll have this pressure switch error on there and you'll go to put your meter lead in there by on the board, on the pin, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it takes off and fires up. And everybody thinks, oh yeah, this is a fluke thing, it's fixed. 
Mm-hmm. Well, it's not because what happens is the pin for the limit and the pressure switch, what happens is they daisy chain them through the stage one boards, but the pin ends up overheating and the solder cracks. Mm-hmm. So what you have to do is I've fixed so many of these things. I just take the board out, take it downstairs, flip it over, take two screws out, and you could solder it back in. And it's fixed in five minutes. But like when all the if they're down a stage of heat, the store is not going to make temp, especially if it's below 10 degrees. Damn. They only got one rooftop unit. Really? Yeah. They, no, I, they don't, the I don't office. think it ever works on an Aldi. They have one for the office and they have a 25 or 35 ton unit in the middle of the store. But if you're down, say board one takes a dump, you're down two stages of heat. So it ain't going to make it. It's just run on the heat reclaim of the rack and, and then the other stage, the other uh, two stages. But so that's one thing on A on units to really watch out for is that pressure switch or limit error. It's 90% of the time it's a cracked, it's a cracked pin on the ignition board. And if you flip it over with a soldering iron, you could fix it. I, I take the little Milwaukee soldering iron up there with me so I don't have to plug it in. It's mm-hmm. fixed in five minutes. So the pin is where again? I was trying to envision it while you're talking. So it's a it's a I think it's a UTI board, the ignition board. It's there's a Molex plug for the limits and the pressure switch and all that stuff. It's one of the pins on the Molex plug that goes into the soldered part of the board. I I no joke if probably I probably fixed like five in the last month. That's crazy. It's a super common issue because they mount the the boards right to where the burners are, and it's smoking hot right there. Oh, I get it. Steel. So the solder gets weak. It gets weak, and then they get a little bit of vibration, and it, and it, that that the harnesses are so tight from the factory that it's got pressure on it too, so it ends up cracking it. So that's one thing I really harp on guys about is that I don't order new ignition modules; I just fix them. Hmm. I've never heard of that happening. That's crazy. That and then making sure that like your outside air dampers are set properly. You don't want to have outside air dampers that are hundred percent closed, especially even in the winter time. Like you want to make sure that when the rooftop shuts off, that it hundred percent closes, but you want to make sure you're still bringing in fresh air from the outside because just like the problems we have, the stores in the winter time or the summertime with humidity and like keeping store temps, if your dampers are closed and your store is in a vacuum, you are going to struggle to keep that cold air from flying in the store. You, you want to be able to heat that air coming in through a rooftop unit. It's more manageable that way than it is coming through the front doors where it's just going to hit everybody and be very uncomfortable. That makes sense. That makes sense. Oh, I thought of something while you were talking and now I just, it lost it. It's gone. Absolutely gone. Uh, Damn, it's gone. (laughs) How many times that happens? Like, all the time. Speaking of HVAC, I totally forgot to, you know, remind you guys to check the operation of the outdoor air dampers and make sure no one has anything jammed in the contactor for the exhaust for the mechanical room. That doesn't bode well. Typically, you will, sometimes you will have sprinklers in there for one. And two, if it gets too cold, you might start condensing your refrigerant where it's not supposed to be condensing, especially in the wintertime when you have a less of a load. If you don't have very much heat being generated, I think we might have talked about this in the first one, but I'll just bring it up again anyway. But potentially condensing in the oil separator or oil reservoir, depending on what kind of pressure you have in there, especially if it gets down really low. You know, yeah, it's a big thing, making sure that, that even the damper shut in the mechanical room, making sure that if it has mechanical dampers, that they actually shut and function because there is nothing worse than a stalled out rack when it, in a mechanical room, it's like ice cold, trying to get that thing back running. It makes it even worse. And then you guys will go over like the stalled out rack. So if you guys do get a stalled out rack and say it's like super, super cold outside, and say the receiver's on a roof or like you can't get it running, 
this is my go-to every single time with this. I will shut the discharge lines going to the condenser. This only works if you have an A9 valve. I will shut the discharge lines going to the condenser. I will mm -hmm. make sure the A9 line is open and I will force the valve all the way in. And then I will take and start a small compressor up. And what I will basically do is build pressure because it can't go through the, the ball valves to the condenser. The only place it can go to is the receiver. So it starts heating up the receiver and pushing whatever liquid was sitting in there that didn't want to move back into the store, which is going to cause you to build pressure now because you're feeding cases because you're pushing that cold liquid deck back down to the store, which is going to start the rack to start slowly start up. So then what you do is you let it chug for a little bit, maybe like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, nice. let it chug and build up. And then to the point where the head starts coming up, then you open up the line to the discharge of the condenser and let it flush all the liquid out of that condenser. It's a high pressure vapor. It's going to force all that liquid out of that condenser and into the receiver. And then it'll jumpstart the rack back to, back to life. How come you couldn't do it if it had a differential valve in there? What do you mean a differential valve? You said it only works if you have an A9 valve in there. So if you have one of the ORDs, the Sporlin, that too. Okay, I just want to make sure. I didn't know if it, I didn't know if there was something special receiver about press, it. Receiver pressurization valve. If you have a receiver pressurization valve, then yes, it'll work. Okay. You you just need to be able to pressurize the receiver. Okay. All right. So the ORD A A8 AOE would actually work as well, as long as you have some means of of running hot gas through a big pipe through a bigger pipe into the receiver your method would work. Correct. Okay. Like the, bull, the bullseye stores, it works awesome. Yeah. Especially with the racks on the, on the roof and it restarts them instantly. But if you guys have racks crashing, there's a reason for it. Don't just start it back up and throw a tarp on it. It doesn't need a tarp. There's some, there's something else wrong. The guy, the, the tarp thing drives me insane. There's something else wrong. There's either cycling issues, load issues, Suction pressure too low. Hey, also, make sure your, your compressors are, are loaded and unloaded properly. I've seen where a bad relay output board was causing a rack to overshoot suction pressure and then it would stay off for a little bit. And then when that thing got 20 degrees outside, it did not want to start back up. Like it, it just it short cycled because it just kept going off in low pressure because it couldn't push the refrigerant out good enough. Yeah, that's you want to make sure that the, the suction properly on loads and loads, but making sure it's not too low. That's why you, you don't want your EPR shutting because once you hit that crit where it's that cold outside, it's probably not going to start back up on its own. No, no matter what you do remotely or whatever, it's probably not going to start back up on its own until somebody forces some contactors on or does something to where they could give it a little bit more load somehow and get, and get it running. Yeah, if you're running on a regular HFO, HFC rack, depends on how low the suction pressure is, EPR should be about 20, 30%, somewhere in that wheelhouse. So if you see your EPRs on your whole rack, like down to 5% or 7% or 10% or even 15%, and you find that the compressors are short cycling, there's a high probability that this, there's something going on either with the unloading or the suction pressure is just too low because someone might have put an offset in it because they couldn't change the set point to a lower suction. So they're trying to fix it, you know, the, the way around by just lying to the controller and saying, oh, yeah, it's a lot more higher than what it is. See that a lot. No, I know. Because I mean, the, the companies out there have locked down the set point so no one can get in, in, in them anymore. People are getting creative and they're like, well, if I just lie to it and tell it, even though I just want to set the suction pressure lower, if I lie to it and say that there's an offset of plus five, now it's going to run five pounds lower than what it was running. So they fixed their issue that they had in the summertime, but now they cause an issue in the wintertime. Nuts. Guys, I think it's going to be it for today for the second part of the winter PMs. Thanks for listening. All right. See you guys next time.